good evening and welcome to our Good Friday service, everyone. We want to welcome you and we are going to sing a song. Uh, it might not be a super familiar song. It's called, O Sacred Head Now Wounded. And um, I'm just going to have you remain seated for this one. You're welcome to sing along if you know it or would like to sing along with it. Um, but I just want you to contemplate uh, what Jesus went through to achieve our atonement on the cross of Calvary. Secret head now wounded with grief and shame weighed down now scornfully surrounded with thorns thy only crown oh sacred head what glory what bliss till now was thine yet Jesus, I pray tonight that you would allow us to just consider your suffering, consider your sacrifice on Calvary, on the way to Calvary. Consider what you went through in the Garden of Gethsemane as you anguished, Lord. And I pray that we would consider what it cost you to purchase our redemption. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Would you please stand and join us as we sing, Jesus Paid It All. Sin had left 
the crimson stain He washed it white as snow
of a word. This the power of the cross. Christ became sin for us. Took the blame for the wrath. We stand forgiven at the have a special treat uh, for you. Um, Randy Weary and I, my brother sitting over here, have been meeting uh, the past several months, I guess it has been, and um, doing some songwriting, and, uh, and we're going to do an original song for you. Dan, uh, Randy, Randy wrote this, and then we kind of got together, arranged it a little bit, and um, and man, the lyrics just, I was like, man, we got to sing this on Good Friday. So I hope you're blessed by this song. Um, the name of it is The Sorrowful Way. The Sorrowful Way. Thank you. 
They delivered him to be crucified This man who died, king of the Jews They laughed and scorned the one who bore A crown of thorns for me and you He said, this cross I bear, I cannot share, though I pray that this cup be passed from me. But I choose to die, for this is why a man born to sin can be set free. Sorrowful way the Savior didn't willingly walk you to save up to Kafkatha and into the grave and out again on the third day and out again on the third day they laid him down and they nailed him up and hung him for all the world to see they pierced his side just after he cried my god why have thou forsaken me as lots were cast forth for the clothes that he wore, Mother Mary and Mary Magdalene Stood by looking on Mary's virgin-born son The firstborn of all who would believe Via Dolorosa, sorrowful way the Savior did willingly walk you to save Up to Kapkatha and into the grave And out again on the third day And out again on the third day Via Dolorosa, sorrowful way the Savior didn't willingly walk you to save Up to Kapkatha and into the grave And out again on the third day And out again on the third day And out again on the third day Amen. And you can stand as we sing a song called Jerusalem. And uh, through all of these songs, we're really wanting to just, through music, take you to the foot of the cross. And uh, I hope that as you uh, see the imagery and all the different aspects of each of one of these songs, that you're just taken and transported right there to the foot of the cross. This is Jerusalem.
the chosen one bring many sons to glory behold the man upon a cross my sin upon his shoulders ashamed i hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers it was my sin that held him there until it was a I know that it is finished I will not boast in anything No gifts, no power, no wisdom But I will boast Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have been my from his reward I cannot give an answer but this I know with all my heart his wounds have paid my ransom his wounds have paid my that as we consider your sacrifice tonight, Lord, that it would just drive us to our knees in humility as we think upon you, Lord, on your great sacrifice. Thank you, Lord, for setting your love upon me, upon us, while we were still dead in our trespasses and in our sins. Thank you, Lord, for purchasing us at Calvary. We know that you paid it in full. There's not one debt that I owe, that any of us owe who are in Christ in this place tonight. So Lord, I pray that we would not strive to earn our salvation because we know that when you declared it was finished upon that cross, that it was paid in full. But oh Lord, let us strive to be like you, holy like you, not because we think we can earn our way to heaven or earn our salvation. Oh no, but because out of a heart of gratitude and love, we want to, to please the one who saved us. Lord, help us to have a, hum, a, a humility about us tonight as we consider what you accomplished at Calvary. We pray these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated this evening. Well, thank you, worship team. I, I know my heart is full after that time. That was almost, I think that might have been the perfect set right there. I don't know. That was, that was beautiful. And Randy, thank you for that song. How powerful and, and beautiful that was. Um, I know your hearts are full, too, when we sing before our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, on a night like tonight that we remember this event, this event that changed everything in the world and the universe, that changed everything in the lives of his children, and I pray in your life as well. 
You can turn in Matthew to Matthew chapter to t- Matthew chapter 27. That's where we'll be tonight. Uh, and as you turn there, I'd like to pray uh, as well as we begin our time together. Let's pray one more time. Heavenly Father, um, we we know that after a million billion years in glory, we will still be awestruck and amazed by the cross. After all those years, the billions upon billions of years in eternity, we know that even in that time, we will not come to a full understanding of the cost that you paid to save our souls. And we'll know that we'll have that reminder, even in glory, of your hands that were pierced, your side that was pierced, your feet that were pierced, an everlasting reminder of the cost and the love that you had for your children to go to the cross, to humble yourself, to be born in human likeness, to die and even die in the most shameful, painful way on the cross for us, for wicked sinners like us, Lord. Lord, tonight may that truth, the truth of the crucifixion again rest upon us. May it fill our hearts, Lord. May we not dwell here too long in despair, but may we have the hope of Resurrection Sunday in our hearts already budding, already looking forward to that Sunday, but remembering on this Good Friday the cost that you paid to get us to heaven, Lord. I pray that that would be uh, what we understand from your word tonight. I pray these things in your name. Amen. Well, in Matthew chapter 7, we're going to look at some things out of the, the gospel account of the crucifixion there. But I, I want to remind you of, of another passage that I'm going to use as sort of the, the mirror to look through into Matthew chapter 7. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The apostle Paul is speaking about the cross, and he's speaking about crucifixion, and he's speaking about it from a, at the same time from a, a Jewish mindset, how Israel and Jews would look at the cross, but also at the same time because Paul is also a, a Roman citizen and under understands the thinking of the Greek and Roman culture, he looks at the cross through how a Gentile, how a Roman and Greek would understand the cross. And this is what he says, very powerful passage that that he's speaking specifically about the cross and the crucifixion. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 18, for the word of the cross is foolishness, it's folly, it's stupidity, It, 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 it makes no sense to those who are perishing. But to those who are being saved is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is he who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through their wisdom, it pleased God through the foolishness of what we preach to save those who believe. For the Jews demand signs. There he is. He looks. The Jews demand a sign and miracles. They want a sign. The Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block, a scandal on to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. The cross is foolishness, it's a scandal, it's nonsensical. It's a defeat to to those that are perishing that don't know Jesus Christ, but to those who are being saved as children, believers, it is the power of God. It's salvation. It's the most precious thing in all the world. So I want you to think of and hold those two ideas in your head as we look at the crucifixion, that it's foolishness to the Gentiles and to the Greeks, and it's a scandal to the Jews. Because in the ancient world, as people looked at the cross, they look at the cross in a much different way than we do today. Much different. You know, a a while ago, I can't remember, a few months ago, I talked about the cross and how we put it on jewelry now. And I made sort of an offhand remark about how how silly that is that, that we would celebrate something so wicked and evil because the cross was one of the most shameful, wicked, evil things that man ever created. That one of the most torturous ways to die. And we've made it into a statement, a jewelry statement, but we know why that is because we see the power of the cross and the meaning of it. But go back to to ancient times and how they viewed the cross. Shameful, wicked, painful. Cicero, the great writer, the great Roman writer said that no Roman citizen was allowed by law to die on a cross. It was too shameful. It was only for criminals and traitors, the very worst of the worst. A Roman citizen could not die by law on the cross. It was too shameful, too wicked. 
It was reserved for the, the very worst of people. F.F. F. Bruce, a commentator of Scripture, said to die by crucifixion was to plumb the lowest depths of disgrace. It was a punishment reserved for those who were deemed unfit to live, a punishment for those who were subhuman. That's how low the cross was seen then. And it wasn't necessarily in the physical pain of the cross was unparalleled by other deaths, but that was not the worst part of the crucifixion and the cross. It was the shame of it. The humiliation of it. It wasn't just physically painful. It was the worst humiliation and shame that a person could face. The cross. It was a fate worse than death. Shame for the Rome, Romans and for the ancient world, shame was worse than death. Better to die than to be shamed. To be dishonored this way. This was the, the fate of the cross. Foolishness. How could God take the, the most shameful thing in the world and save through that. The Greek says that's impossible. That makes no sense. The Jew says this is impossible. They stumbled over the cross. They stumbled over the death of Jesus. How could God Almighty choose this way for his son to die to bring salvation? That makes no sense to them. It's foolishness. It's a stumbling block. But to those who are being saved, to those that know Jesus Christ, have the Holy Spirit living inside of them, it is the power and the wisdom and the salvation of God. The cross, you see, is a paradox. It, it, it turns everything upside down. The, think, the, the things the world thinks they know has been flipped upside down by the cross. It's a paradox. And I want to show you today, in the time that we have tonight, I should say, before we take communion, uh, six ways that the, the, that the foolishness and the shame of the cross turns the world upside down. How the world got it completely wrong. That it's upside down. Six ways God takes the cross and turns it upside down and turns our lives upside down. And we'll see them in a moment from Matthew chapter 27. The first way that we see in Scripture is that he who is shamed on the cross is the one who shames his enemies. He who is shamed on the cross is actually the one who shames his enemies. The shame of the cross is turned around and it is Christ, the King, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who shames his enemies. Colossians chapter 2, verse 15 says this, speaking of the cross, Christ disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. He triumphed over his enemies on the cross. The very instrument that they thought was bringing shame to him was the very instrument that brought shame to them, was the very moment of their defeat. They thought it was their moment of victory. It was the moment of their defeat. The cross is a paradox. It turns our understandings upside down. He who is innocent is punished like the guilty. He who is the lion of the tribe of Judah is slaughtered like a lamb. It's premeditated murder, but it's predestined sacrifice by God the Father. They took his life. They thought he surrendered his life. Death was their goal, but life was the true outcome of the cross. It was the greatest act of hate in human history, putting the Son of God on a cross. And yet it was the greatest act of love. Turned upside down, it was actually the, the greatest demonstration of love. God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we're sinners, Christ died for us. From hate to love, he was broken so that we can be healed. He was rejected so that we would be accepted and never rejected. He was killed so that we may never die. This is the paradox. They thought it was the end. The disciples thought this was it. This was the end. Actually, it was only the beginning. They thought that they had triumphed. Satan thought he had triumphed. Sin and death thought they had won the day, but it was the very moment of their defeat. The disciples thought this was the worst day. But we know as we look back to Good Friday through Easter Sunday, it's actually the best day, the great day, the good day when our sins were paid for by Jesus on the cross. He who was shamed shames his enemies. He chose this. Philippians 2.8 says that he humbled himself, right? And he was made in the appearance of man and he humbled himself to death, comma, even death on the cross. Death wasn't shameful enough. Death wasn't big enough. It, it had to be a death on the most shameful way, death on the cross. Secondly, he who was mocked as the king is actually the true king. He is the king of kings and he's the Lord of lords. Matthew chapter 27 uh, verse 27, 27, 27, we'll start there. 
Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters and they gathered the whole battalion. If you have a study Bible there, you'll see a footnote and a battalion of Roman soldiers was how many? 600. One man, Jesus Christ, 600 soldiers, a battalion. They gathered the whole battalion before him and they stripped him and they put a scarlet robe on him and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and they put a reed in his hand and they kneeled before him and they mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him. And they took the reed and they struck him on the head with it. And when they had mocked him and stripped him of his robe and they put on his own clothes back on him and they led him away to be crucified. The standard practice of the Romans were to scourge, uh, uh, someone was going to be crucified, to scourge them, to weaken them, right? We've seen this. We know what that entails. You've heard sermons on this. The, the whip with pieces of glass and bone and stone on the end so that when the whip goes in, it doesn't just go beyond it. It stops, and then they pull chunks of, of flesh from his back. They expose nerves and bone and muscle. Many, many people died just from the scourging. Just from the scourging, the loss of blood and the trauma of that, they would die from that. But that was part of the process to get them ready for the cross so that they would die on the cross. They want them to be losing blood. They want them to be weak. And they, they whipped it. This was standard practice. But what was not standard practice, the commentators tell us, is to shame someone in this way. You don't bring in 600 soldiers to shame one man. What's the point? What, what in the world is the point? The commander gathers his 600 battalion that are under his command and says, we're going to crucify this guy. Well, who cares? We crucify people every day. That's what the Romans did. But no, this guy's different. We need to, 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 to mock him, to spit upon him, to deride him, to shame him. 600 men, hardened Roman soldiers that had killed and seen the worst of humanity. 600 of them, wicked men, chosen to, to spew out the most po possibly shameful and humiliating things they could do on one man, Jesus Christ. Picture the scene. If the scourging was not enough, if the torture was not enough, the, the robe and the reed and the crown of thorns and the kneeling and the mocking and the spitting, 600 men spitting upon you. Why? Why? To, to this level, did Jesus have to suffer to this level to shame him? To shame everyone who followed him. To, to make a precedent to say, anyone who claims to be the king, anyone who claims to be the side, this is what awaits you. Shame is the, is the reason why. And they shame him and they mock him and say, hail king of the Jews. But isn't it something, the paradox of the cross, that their words, although meant to mock him, are actually true. He is the king. He is the king. They say those words in a mocking, but they actually are speaking truth. You turn that upside in Psalm 2, 4. Psalm 2, 4, it says that he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord mocks them. Those that mock the king, he's the true king. And it is God the Father who scoffs at the nations and scoffs at the Roman Empire and scoffs at the British Empire and the American Empire and scoffs and mocks to think that we have power or authority in any way. The, the cross, the paradox of the cross, he who's mocked is actually. Thirdly, he who is seen as powerless is actually all-powerful God. To look at the cross with human eyes and to see only in a human way, you see a man defeated, you see a man utterly helpless and weak and, and shamed and beaten and defeated. That's what we see through human eyes. But we know that's not the truth. We know at that exact same moment that Jesus Christ, who is all man and all God, at that moment that he's being mocked and spit upon. At that moment, he's crucified, and the people are walking by mocking him and hurling insults at him. It wasn't enough that the Romans did it, then the crowds did it. At that very moment and through all of that, he is omnipotent God. He's omnipotent God. At any moment, he could have stopped that. He holds all power. We just sang in one of the songs, what a powerful line, I can't remember, but it was talking about he who made the sun and the moon and the stars hangs on a cross. Our creator God, our omnipotent God. Read on in, in chapter 27, verse 32. And they went out and they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry the cross. Jesus is so weakened in his flesh and his humanity, he can't carry the cross. He's near death. 
And at the same time that he can't hold that cross beam as he carries to Golgotha is the very moment again that he is God incarnate in the flesh. He's omnipotent God. Simon carries his cross and they came to a place called Golgotha, which is the place of the skull. And they offered wine from the drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not, he would not drink it. And, and when they had crucified him, that's the only mention of crucifixion. Then when they crucified him, they divided his garments among them and cast lots. And they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head, they put a charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. And then two robbers were crucified with him, and one on his right and one on his left. And those that passed by derided him, wagging their heads, the, 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 the onlookers. And not only that, they, they say, the onlookers, you would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Save yourself if you're the son of God. Come down. They mock him. And even the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying he saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross, and we will believe in him. He who trusts in God, let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. Verse 44, and the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him the same way. Not a moment of peace. Not a moment to die in peace. The soldiers, the Romans, the, the onlookers, the scribes, the Pharisees, even those being crucified next to him, mocking him, hurling insults upon him, deriding him. This is our Lord and Savior. This is God omniscient, omnipotent. All-powerful God, creator God, fully God, fully man, in suffering incredible pain as a human being. Very few people will suffer the kind of human pain that Jesus Christ suffered on that cross, but that's not the point. If the point was human pain, then, then the writer of Matthew, Matthew, who writes the Gospel of Matthew, would spend a lot more time than just saying, and they crucified him. They would describe the human pain and what happened like Mel Gibson does in that movie. They would spend verse upon verse and chapter upon chapter saying, this is exactly what happened. The nails went here and this happened, this happened. They would lay out the physical pain if that was the point, but the point is not the physical pain, right? The point is the spiritual pain. What Jesus Christ suffered as the Son of God in his divinity was far greater than any human being will ever suffer. What he suffered in that moment of time on the cross was he bore our sins on him. And think this through. What is, the, what is the, the penalty for our sins? The day you eat the fruit, you shall surely die. Right? That's what he says in the garden. Death is the penalty for our sin. Is he speaking about physical death? Yes. But is he ultimately speaking about spiritual death? You will die spiritually. You're going to go to hell. You're going to be separated from God. And you're going to be tormented in everlasting punishment in a place called the lake of fire, eternal separation, eternal torment in hell. That's your punishment for sin. That is what Jesus Christ had to take on the cross. Our hell. If you are a child of God tonight, he took your eternal hell upon himself on that cross. He suffered in eternity for your sin in that moment of time. He didn't suffer for eternity like we would, but he took our eternal. He is divine. He's God. And he bore our eternal hell. Think about that. All of his children... All of his children, he took all of their hells upon himself. And in that moment, he suffers eternity in hell for his children. That's our punishment. That's what he took on for us, willingly. And at any moment, he could have stopped that. Are we worth that? Are we worth that? Of course we're not. Of course we're not worth that. He did that for us. He suffered and bore our punishment. And he did it willingly. He could have stopped it at any moment. He who they see is powerless, is all-powerful. And in his omnipotence, his all-power, he had to be an omnipotent God to take our hells on him. No man, no created being. Only God can take that on. And he willingly took that on. In the moment that they say, look at him, he can't even get off the cross in that moment. He is bearing our punishment because he's almighty God. Fourthly, he who cannot save himself actually saves others. He who cannot save himself is actually saving his children. For all time. From Adam to the last possible person that will ever be saved in, in human history. He's saving them in that moment. This is the moment that, that their sins will be covered. We are all saved by the cross. Any Christian from Old Testament 
believer to New Testament is saved by the cross of Jesus Christ. There's no salvation outside the blood of Jesus Christ. Matthew 27, keep reading verse 41. So also the chief priests, oh, I already read that. The mocking continues. The chief priests mock him. He saved others. Let him save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him if he, if he so desires. The robbers mock him. They continue to mock him. How come he can't save himself? He said he was God. If he's God, why can't he come off the cross? Of course he could have come off the cross. But here's the thing. Jesus Christ, as God, could not, could not save himself and also save us. He had to die to save us. Oh, he could have come off that cross and saved himself. Yes. And he would have every right, and he would have been totally justified and righteous and holy if he said, it's not worth it. I'm not drinking the cup. I decided not to, and, he would, it, it, and that would have been fine. But he stayed on the cross, and he paid that penalty for us. He could not come off that cross without dying and still save us because the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. Death had to happen. Someone had to pay the price. That's the way God is. God is just. And he set up the, the, the system, and this is the system. Someone has to pay the price. So if Jesus refused to pay the price, he could have just snapped his fingers and save us. Blood had to be spilled. It had to be God's blood. It had to be God incarnate. Only his blood, only his death would be able to save all of his children. That's the requirement of death. Jesus did not save himself on the cross because he's saving us. He stayed on that cross and he died on that cross to save us. He paid the price with his death to keep us from eternal death. He could have saved himself, but he could not have saved himself and come off that cross and still saved us. He was not weak in that moment. He was all-powerful God, bearing not just the sin, our sins, but bearing the very wrath of God, his Father, on that cross. Fifthly, he who cries in despair is trusting in God absolutely. He who we think cries out in despair is actually trusting God absolutely. Verse 45, Matthew 27, 45. From the sixth hour, there was darkness over the whole land. From 12 noon to 3 o'clock, there was darkness. About the ninth hour, Jesus cries out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthan, which is, means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it, this man is calling for Elijah. And one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait and see. Let's see if Elijah will come and save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and he yielded up his spirit. Many misunderstand this cry as a cry of defeat, a cry of doubt. Right? They, they, that's what they see. That's what they, they hear there, that he's crying out for, for help in despair. That's not the cry. It's a cry of victory. It's not a cry of doubt. Is Jesus in pain? Yes. Does he doubt? No, there's no doubt. Is this a cry of victory? Yes, this is the cry of victory. Not of pain, not of defeat. He doesn't cry out and yield up his spirit in a loud voice. It's a cry of victory. It's a cry of it is finished, the gospel tells us. It is over. It is finished. I've paid the debt. I've ransomed my children. I've atoned for their sin. I've paid their debt. Heaven is now open to them. Heaven is now open. Jesus takes our sin and our judgment so that we will never be judged. He who cries in despair, who we think cries in despair, cries in absolute trust. Lastly, he who is rejected actually opens heaven to his children. He who is rejected or we think is rejected by dying in the most shameful way, we look at that and say, well, God must have turned his back on Jesus and abandoned Jesus. No, no. He actually opens heaven to his children. Look at this beautiful verse. And we sang about this in one of the songs too, about the veil being ripped in two. In verse 51, Psalm, uh, Matthew 27, 51. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were spilt. What does that mean? What is that significance? Well, we know that, that, that veil that separated the, the holy place from the holies of holies, God's very presence, that they couldn't go in there. The high priest could go on there once a, once a year, once a day, once a year on the day of atonement and atone for the sins of Israel because that was the presence of God and you can't be in the presence of God with sin. That God's presence was always separated from man by sin. And we see at the death of Jesus Christ, that veil being ripped down from top to bottom 
no longer will there be a separation between God and man. In fact, Scripture tells us in the book of Acts that God will come and live inside of us. There'll be no separation. The Holy Spirit will live inside us. God will live in us. He will live in us. That's the great promise of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. There is no separation between God and his children. Jesus paid the debt. His blood has opened heaven to us. And now God dwells inside of his children. No separation because Jesus paid the price for our sin. As we sang, and I'm so glad Christian put this in the it's a great hymn, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Right? Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. There's no more separation between God and man because Jesus Christ paid the price, took, the, took our judgment, took our sin, took our shame, took our eternal punishment and opened heaven to us. The cross is not a defeat. It's the greatest of all victories. And it's validated and it's, and it's shown on Easter Sunday. And we'll talk about that on Sunday, but that's the, the victory. In these three days, the disciples live in a state of despair and discouragement thinking this is the end. It's not the end. It's, it's the victorious resurrection we wait for that validates the cross, that validates everything Jesus said and taught and did. The cross turns the world upside down, absolutely upside down. What we think in our wisdom, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says, we're wrong. God's wisdom looks like foolishness, but it's our wisdom, our thinking, and the cross turns it upside down. And I pray tonight, I pray tonight as we get ready for our time of communion, I pray tonight that the cross has, changed, has turned your life upside down. It t- turned your life upside down. That Jesus Christ dwells in you and has forgiven your sins tonight. That you're a child of God. That you're saved and redeemed. That you've been justified. That God no longer looks at you in anger at your sin, but your sin has been propitiated. It's been handled. And he looks on you with great joy. Because you're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. That he doesn't look on Alan Briggs and all of my sin and all of my shame. He looks at Jesus' finished work on the cross and I'm clothed in the righteousness of Christ. That's what Good Friday's about. That's what we celebrate here. Is the cross foolishness? Is it a stumbling block? Is it a scandal? No. It's the power of God and the wisdom of God. Let's pray. And as I pray, if the elders would come forward now and get ready for our time of communion. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, our hearts are full tonight. It was so good to sing to you, to praise you. It's so inadequate, our human words, our stuttering tongues and mouths, our sinful minds and hearts. It's so inadequate to, to think that our songs could mean anything to the God of the universe, but they do. You're pleased by our worship. You inhabit our worship. And that blows us away, Lord. We're humbled and amazed by that. Lord, as we came to your word, we took just a few moments to contemplate your cross. I pray that your cross and your death and your sacrifice, your atoning, sacrificial death for our lives would become big in our lives, Lord. And we would become smaller that the understanding of what exactly you did on the cross to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, to to make us clean and pure and righteous before you, to declare us righteous in Christ. Lord, that is a, 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 a truth that, again, given a billion upon a billion years in glory, we'll never wrap our minds completely around that, Lord. But Lord, our stammering, sinful tongues can just say thank you and just praise your name tonight. Lord, I pray now as we move into a time of communion, Lord, that you would knit our hearts together with you on this Good Friday. That we would remember the cost it was to go to the cross, to pay for our sins, Lord. That we would realize that, Lord. That we would live in that moment and realize that you took our hell for us. You took our shame on you to make sure that we could get to glory, Lord. We thank you. We we love you tonight. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, as we move into our time of communion on this Good Friday, what an appropriate night and time to do communion as we remember Christ's death uh, for us and we celebrate his broken body and his blood spilt for us. But it's very important as we come before uh, this communion, be this table, and we celebrate uh, the death of Jesus Christ that we remember that this is a sacred time, this is an important time that we do. 
We do this in remembrance of Jesus Christ. We do this to remember his sacrifice for us. So what I want to do is we enter into this time, and in a moment we'll pass the elements and partakers. But before we do that, I, I, I want to extend a warning to you, a warning that the Apostle Paul gives us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. As he speaks about this time, we've been doing this as the, the people of God for 2,000 years. Jesus instituted this on the night he was betrayed. The night before he went to the cross, he began this practice of communion, and we continue it until he comes back. We continue this, and heaven, there'll be no need for this. We'll have Jesus. We'll have, the, we'll have him. But until that day happens, till our faith is made sight, this is the way that, that Christ has instituted that we remember his death. And the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that we should not partake of the bread and the cup in an unworthy manner, in a sinful manner. That before you partake of this, you need to make sure that you are right with God. As a believer in Jesus Christ, what we do here is only for believers. But as, what we do here is, is to be done with a clean conscience. And that's why we leave you time to, to, to talk to the Lord in a moment and to confess anything in your life that may be a barrier to you partaking of us in a, in a worthy manner. This is what the Apostle Paul says about this time. He says that whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment upon himself. So we want to, as, as the body of Christ that meets here at David's church, we want to make sure that we come before this with, with a clean heart. We're not sinless. No one here is sinless. But I want to give you just a few moments of quiet prayer that you can quietly talk to the Lord and confess anything in this moment that may be hindering you partaking of this. So let's just bow and have a few moments of quiet prayer. Heavenly Father, we the saints, blood-bought saints, who meet here in this building, confess our sins. We, we are a weak people. We are easily ensnared in sin. We are easily tempted. We sin way more than we should. We are not as far along in our sanctification, our growth, that we should be. We confess it. Sin easily ensnares us, Lord. Those temptations that have been in our lives, our old lives, are still there. We haven't put them to death like we should have, Lord. We confess them to you. We confess our feelings of fear, of anxiety, of worry, of greed, of lust, of hatred for our fellow man, uh, of apathy, of not caring of not giving like we should, not serving like we should, not using our gifts like we should. Lord, uh, there are many sins we confess as a corporate body today in this moment. We know that those sins are forgiven. They've been nailed to the cross, and we no longer are held accountable to them, Lord, but we confess them because we realize in this life, in this moment, before we meet you in glory and are perfected and glorified, Lord, we still struggle in these sins, and we recognize that. Make us a holy people. Make us a holy people. Wash these sins away from us, Lord. Wash our consciences clean. Make us righteous, Lord. We are declared righteous in you and justified. Lord, may we now be righteous. May we live out the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, Lord. Help us to do that on this Good Friday. Lord, as we partake of the, the, the bread now and, and we realize that it is broken, because your body was broken on that cross. We, 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 we think about this bread. We think about your body, the body that should have been our body. We should have paid this debt. We, this is our debt, our sins, Lord. But you paid a debt that wasn't yours. You, you took on our sin and our shame. Your body was broken so that our bodies would never be broken. And so that our bodies can be in fellowship for eternity in heaven with Jesus Christ. Help us to, to, to remember that on this Good Friday. We pray, pray this in your name. Amen.
The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 recounts that day and he says, For what I received from the Lord, I deliver unto you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus, we thank you for the blood, the blood of the new covenant, the blood that washes away our sin, the blood that redeems us from our sin, the blood that we have believed in that was spilt on that cross, Lord, that forgives us all of our sins. What a beautiful, marvelous, precious thought that the blood of Jesus forgives us of all of our sins. Lord, as we partake of this cup, we remember the cost, the, the blood that was spilt, the, the blood that you gave to substitute yourself for us, it should have been our lives. It should have been our eternity. It should have been our blood that was spilt. But you substitute yourself for us. You atone for our sins, Lord. As we partake of the, the, the cup of the new covenant, we remember that covenant of grace that it only requires us and only asks of us to receive the free gift of grace through faith of salvation, Lord. How precious that thought is on this Good Friday. We pray. In your name.
1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25, the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, continues. In the same way also, Jesus took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Amen. Well, as we close our time together, there's a bit of a tradition I didn't realize I was building here on Good Friday services, but it's to show a certain video, and my daughter bugged me literally about a million times to show the video. So in our, in our last moments here, let's watch Sunday's Coming. It's Friday. Jesus is praying. Peter's are sleeping. Judas is betraying. But Sunday's coming. It's Friday. Pilate's struggling. The council is conspiring. The crowd is vilifying. They don't even know that Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are running like sheep without a shepherd. Mary's crying. Peter is denying, but they don't know that Sundays are coming. It's Friday. The Romans beat my Jesus. They robe him in scar. They crown him with thorns. But they don't know that Sundays come. It's Friday. See Jesus walking to Calvary. His blood dripping, his body stumbling, and his spirit's burden. But you see, it's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The world's winning. People are sinning. And evil's grinning. It's Friday. The soldiers nailed my Savior's hands to the cross. They nailed my Savior's feet to the cross. And then they raised him up next to criminals. It's Friday. But let me tell you something. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are questioning what has happened to their king. And the Pharisees are celebrating that their scheming has been achieved. But they don't know, it's only Friday. Sunday's coming, it's Friday. He's hanging on the cross, feeling forsaken by his father, left alone and dying. Can nobody save him? Oh, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. It's Friday, the earth trembles, the sky grows dark, my king yields his spirit. It's Friday, hope is lost, death has won, sin has conquered, and Satan's just a laugh. It's Friday. Jesus is buried. A soldier stands guard. And a rock is rolled into place. But it's Friday. It is only Friday. Sunday is a coming. All right. Sunday's come. Let's go ahead and stand now. Oh, does anybody know? Sunday's coming. Oh, that's a powerful preacher, isn't it? Well, I want to thank you for coming on this Good Friday service. Just a reminder, we have the egg hunt tomorrow at 1 o'clock. We have our sunrise service and breakfast at 6.30 in the Grove. And then we have our Easter celebration service here at 10.30. Hymn sing at 10 before the service and service at 10.30. We'd love to have you out for that time as well. But as we dismiss, let me pray for you. 
uh, and this, this, this Good Friday. Now unto him who is able to present us faultless before the throne room of grace, to him be all majesty and all glory and all honor forever and ever, for now and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.